can you hear? Oh, there I am. <laughs> oh, come on. That was a great joke. You should have laughed hard at that. I did. <laughs> so, um, hi, I'm Mary Claire Groovy. I'm a religious studies major here at Appalachian State. I'm a senior. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about getting God out of the closet tonight. Um, so, queer theology is like many theologies. There's different types of ways to view God and view the Bible and different ways to view Christianity in general. Um, so, queer theology is a theology done by and for LGBT people. I would like to first point out that I am not a member of the LGBT community, so what I'm doing tonight is simply explaining it to you. I do not claim to be a queer theologian. I might be able to answer some questions you have, but I am not a queer theologian. Uh, the second thing I would like to point out is that I personally am going, plan on going into the ministry. I would like to go to seminary. I'm Methodist. Hopefully Duke. I'm sorry, you Chapel Hill fans. I hope they went too. Everyone's in the ACC. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so I, this topic is very important to me because the LGBT community is often shunned by the church. I don't know if you've seen or heard anything about that. Maybe some mall preachers out on campus. <laughs> Um, there are three ways in which the church, or at least what I found growing up in the church, it, the ways that they deal with the LGBT community. Number one is, you're going to hell. You're in the LGBT community, you are not getting into heaven, you are sitting. And that's really curious to me because there are only seven verses in the Bible that talk about homosexuality versus all the rest of these. The second thing I would like to point out the church does with the LGBT community is, yes, Jesus loves you. Welcome to our church. We're so glad that you're here. But we really can't have you preaching in church. We really don't want you leading worship. We really don't want you with our children volunteering or anything like that. And the third way in which I found that the church, my particular denomination, deals with LGBT community is to completely ignore that community. To say, you know, homosexual marriage, that's great. That's a political issue. That's not our issue. And I would like to change that personally within the church. And this is why this topic is so important to me. I find that so many people lose God, lose faith, lose community because of these three issues. And I'm tired of it, and I'm tired of looking at that and saying, wow, like, is this the only way in which the church can confront the LGBT community? And that's when I found queer theology. Um, so queer theology can be done in three different ways. Number one, it is LGBT people talking about God in a spiritual manner. That's pretty self-explanatory. If you're a member of the LGBT community and you're discussing God, then you're doing queer theology. Number two, LGBT, LGBT people talking about God in a self-conscious, transgressive manner. So we'll get to that in a second. It's pretty exciting. Um, and number three, probably the most radical, is talking about God that deconstructs natural binary categories of sex and gender. Because we are talking about the supernatural, this transcends the natural categories of a heteronormative society. And that is probably the most radical because that number three often pulls from the Bible. And we'll see how. <laughs> Behind curtain number three. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, looking at number two, this man is Justin Tannis. Justin Tannis is a transgender man. Uh, he was born female. He never felt female. He never felt like a girl or a woman, and he also felt a call to ministry. He felt a call by God, and he compares being a transgender man to the idea of, or becoming a man, to the idea of being called to ministry. And this is pretty radical in and of itself, but those parallels and that natural feeling that he felt inspired him to become a minister and to minister to the transgender community. So, that's just one way in which you can talk about God in a self-conscious, transgressive manner. Justin Tannis has also written a book, if you're interested. A little plug there. He's a really interesting guy, and I found his work quite fascinating. 
No, so now moving on to the Bible, let's talk about the Old Testament and the book of Ruth. So if you don't know, the book of Ruth is about a woman named Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Um, so Naomi is in a foreign land. She's a Hebrew woman. Her and her husband and her two sons, and her two sons are married to two Moab women. They're in the land of Moab. Ruth and Orpah are the two women. And then tragically, both sons and... Naomi's husband die. It happens in the space of about two verses. So the, the book of Ruth itself is mostly focused on women. Um, it's interesting to note that after the grieving period is done, Naomi says to Ruth and Orpah, you know, go home, go home to your families. This isn't really your place. I'm going to return to Bethlehem, where I'm from. She's a Hebrew woman. And after much urging, uh, Ruth and Orpah, Orpah leave. Or, sorry, Orpah leaves. Ruth, it says, clings. The verb there is actually cleaves. It's the same verb used in, um, it's a Hebrew word. <laughs> Clearly, the Bible is written in Hebrew, at least Old Testament. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the word cleave is also the same word used when describing the idea of Adam and Eve and their marriage. When a man um, becomes old enough, he will leave his um, father and mo mother and cling or be cleaved to his wife. Um, and so that verb is also used here in this verse. And to read from this verse, um, so Ruth says that she won't go back um, and she will continue on with Naomi to a foreign land. And Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. You people, Your people will be my people, your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Does this sound familiar at all? It might. It's often used in Christian and Jewish marriage ceremonies. It's interesting to put that there. It's a very almost romantic relationship that happens between Ruth and Naomi. And you have to ask yourself, why does Ruth go with Naomi? Even if she had a bad home life, what would be the purpose in returning to Bethlehem with her. She has no family there. She, she's a widow. She has no opportunity for marriage, really. Maybe, maybe there will be family there who will marry her. But by far, to travel hundreds of miles, possibly getting raped, these two women traveling together in ancient Israel, that sounds like, like, why? Why would you do that? It's just odd that that happens. Um, the next... So, moving right along. The next passage I would look, like to look at is between a um, very famous king of Israel, David. David and Jonathan. So, if you don't know, David is the second king of Israel. Before him is Saul. Saul's son is Jonathan. And this is the moment when Jonathan and Saul and David all kind of first meet each other. And in 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 5, by the way, this is the NIV version, if you're curious. Um, most translations, I personally prefer the ESV, but most translations come to about the same. But um, 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 5, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing, that was on him, and gave it to David, and his armor, and even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all people, also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, looking at that um, verse and the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and loved him as his own soul. That's already pretty suggestive of a romantic relationship, but that could be simply a homosocial relationship, the idea of just intense friendship. I'm willing to buy that. But looking at the idea of, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him. I don't know about you guys, but... I don't just strip naked in front of my best friend ever. Like, it's not a thing that I do. Um, I, I've never known anybody's friendship to compose of that. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty suggestive. Um, 
And if that really doesn't ring true with you, for some reason you're like, nah, they're just friends, you know? Uh, I would like to point out another instance of possible homoerotic relationship between David and Jonathan. Um, and that is in 1 Samuel 20, 1 through 4. Um, it says, and then David fled from Nioth and Ramah, Nioth, Nioth, I don't know, anyway, <laughs> and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father? that he seeks my life. And he said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It is not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes, and he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. So Jonathan and David are tight at this point. Um, Saul, David finds so much favor in the eyes of the Israelites that Saul um, actually is jealous of this and eventually seeks out David's life and wants to kill him. Of course, in this passage, Jonathan says, no, no, my father doesn't want to kill you. Don't be ridiculous. You know, of course, you know, he would tell me if anything was wrong. And David's like, no, really, this is happening. And so Jonathan's like, all right, well, he says at the very end, whatever you say, I will do for you. That's a pretty strong statement to be made from the son of a king to the king's enemy. Why would you deny your entire family, similar to Ruth in this fashion, why would you deny your entire family just for some, this person, like, it seems a little odd. Like, I don't know about you, there's very few friends that I would do that for. Just completely shut aside my mother and my father, unless maybe they were my own family. And maybe that's how Jonathan felt for David. That is a suggestion of queer theology. Um, fast forwarding to a little time we like to call the New Testament. So what would Jesus do? Drag, apparently. Um, several queer theologians. Yeah, I like the pictures, too. It was really fun finding these on the internet. Um, so um, queer theologians like to point out the fact, um, first of all, Virginia Ramey Mollencott claims that Jesus was female. And her argument, now bear with me, this is a little kooky, but her argument is that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Now, according to our science textbooks, um, a woman has two X chromosomes. So where are you getting that other Y, Jesus? <laughs> That's my question. Jesus or God doesn't have a gender, apparently. So <laughs> uh, it's a little far stretch. Stretch, you know. Maybe maybe Jesus was trans. We'll never know. But um, other queer theologians point to this and say, well, actually, maybe not quite that technical. But Jesus often shows a lot of feminine qualities. Turn the other cheek. This idea of washing my disciples' feet, these are not typical masculine things to do in a society, especially in a society subjugated by Roman rule. You want to be assertive of your power. And the fact that Jesus dies on a cross, where we have Holy Week next week and Easter, so look forward to that. Um, so this is really an interesting um, concept, this idea of trans-Jesus, that Jesus embodies both female and masculine characters. Um, so, those are just some of the basics of queer theology. There's a lot more out there, and I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to look at that. Um, a couple of other verses that um, queer theologians look at. I would particularly like to point out the middle one, Galatians 3.28. You can read the other two on your own. And there's several reasons why queer theologians pick these out. I encourage you to find out. Wikipedia that. Um, but Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Short of preaching at you, this idea is that cultural boundaries don't matter, socioeconomic boundaries don't matter, and gender boundaries don't matter. And that is particularly evident in queer theology. God transcends gender. He is above the natural order of things. He is supernatural. All right, so... Um, if you're interested, uh, personally, I found Patrick S. Ching's work to be really fascinating. He writes Radical Love, an Introduction to Queer Theology. And Virginia Ramey Mollencott is one of the original founders of queer theology. 
Uh, she wrote a book in the 1970s entitled, uh, it's a little outdated now, but The Homosexual is My Neighbor, Marcella Althaus Reed. Sorry, I never know if I'm pronouncing her name right. But she has also particularly picked up queer theology in the 90s and developed it from there. Um, and here are a couple books, too. But I would just like to reiterate the fact that queer theology is like any other theology. It's like process theology. It's like liberation theology. There are a million different ways to view God, to view Christianity, the Bible, whatever. Like, queer theology is one of those many ways. And it is legitimate. For the people who are part of the LGBT community, this is their connection to God. And personally, as a Christian, I have no excuse of stopping that anymore, of closing the door, the church door in their face. Thank you.